Um, my name's David. Um, so just a little caveat. Um, when I'm not doing design, I'm a psychoanalyst. So I take a very uh, different approach to design. And um, what I'd like to do, well, wh when I was invited, actually, let me start my clock so I make sure I don't just do a Led Zeppelin thing and ramble on. So um, I thought it was interesting that it's called Dan, right? So I figured I'd talk about flow uh, because, well, it, it seemed to make sense. So um, what I want to do for the next uh, 15 or 20 minutes, whatever it is, is talk to you about flow in design. Uh, and I think the, I'm going to really talk about four principles, and then I'm going to give you an example of a project I've been working on for the last year or so up at Columbia University uh, that really is just focusing on applying these four principles to design. So uh, what is flow? So flow is optimized experience, literally. This is a principle taken from positive psychology. I'm very, very interested in applying psychology, even psychoanalysis, to design and applying design to psychoanalysis and just the relationships between the two. So flow literally is optimized experience from a psychological perspective. Uh, when you're in flow, we've all experienced it. It's one of those things where you're just chugging along and all of a sudden you're like, wow, it's lunchtime already. That's what it's like to be in a state of flow. Uh, psychologically, it's a state of being that trumps a state of doing. So you're being, you're in the present moment, you're here now, you're not somewhere else, you're not like, oh, is it almost lunchtime? You're in the moment, you're doing your thing, and you're really, really focused on it. So I want to talk about flow and the four principles that, that, that I believe are absolutely vital to designing specifically for flow. So uh, designing for flow in Quartz 4 includes four core principles, and it's a recursive process. So uh, a lot of work that I do is assessing whole systems, and I don't like waste, right? Waste is just, you know, we produce a lot of waste, and well, it just it's waste. So I like systems that recur, systems that use the waste that's produced from the system to influence the next iteration of the system. Okay, for everyone, right? So this idea that whatever it is that we use to design can then be used to improve the design. Okay, so, so that's the perspective I'm coming from. So what I want to do is talk about the principles first, and then I want to introduce the process. So I want to give you an example. It's like, wow, all right, here are these principles. Oh, my gosh. But then I want to give you a concrete example of how these principles are being applied. All right, cool. So... Uh, the first principle um, is the valuing of effectiveness. So um, this is very simple. It's can tasks be completed? I'll give you a, a simple example. You all made it here tonight, right? So there's effectiveness. You're here. You made it. So the first thing with any kind of UX is can people complete what it is they want to do? Does it really nothing else matters? Is can they do what it is that they want to be able to do? Uh, and that's really measured very simply, yes or no. And if I asked everyone a question about effectiveness, we would all have a high degree of agreement, right? We would all say, yes, we made it here, right? So something about when, when we're talking about effectiveness in flow, um, there's usually a high level of agreement whether it's been achieved or not. Okay, cool. The second principle is efficiency. Uh, and efficiency is how long does it take to complete a task, multiple tasks. And this is measured in time. This is where things begin to break down a little bit, right? Uh, when I was coming in here, there was some problems at the door. And so did that affect my efficiency? Not really. But for some people, it might have affected their efficiency getting in here, right? It took an extra amount of time to get in here than they had anticipated. So when we start talking about efficiency in design, things start to kind of fragment, right? What's efficient for you might not be efficient for me. And you know, our whole economy is based on you know, unions and workers uh, uh, and bosses arguing over what's efficient or not, right? This is, you know, this is basically Karl Marx's main, main thing is efficiency, right? So we're interested in not only can people complete things that they want to complete, but can they do them in an efficient way? The question is, well, what's efficient? And we'll get to that. Okay, cool, moving on. 
Satisfaction. Are people satisfied with their experience? So now things really blow up, right? Because you may have gotten here, right? We're all here. You may have been effective uh, in getting up here, but let's say you had a bad day at work. So you're a little agitated, right? You're kind of a little off. Uh, your satisfaction uh, might not be as high as it could be if, for instance, you had a great day at work, right? So measuring satisfaction uh, uh, is much more ambiguous than measuring e efficiency and effectiveness. This is where emotion comes in. There's been, I'm interested in, in questions about emotion because the word emotion's been being thrown around here and yet, you know, at least from a feeling perspective, there's at least 350 distinct different feelings that a person can experience at any given time. So, you know, I'm, I, I'm interested in, in, in feelings and emotions. It's, it's a big part of what I do as a psychoanalyst. Uh, 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 but it just, if this is where we're going, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in what we really know about them. So four is valuing the mental model. And this is measured by the ratio of guessing how to do something versus learning how to do something, okay? Um, think about it. Uh, 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 guessing how to do something takes an enormous amount of less cognitive effort than learning how to do something, right? So uh, uh, um, learning how to do something usually requires us to say, I'm going, to, so, so when we go into any system, digital system, any system, we say to ourselves, all right, this is what I have. What is it that I want to do? How is it that I anticipate doing it? I draw on a mental model, right? And so that mental model is either going to sync up with the design or it's going to be off. And if the mental model I expect to use isn't the mental model that the system is designed for, then I'm going to have to learn the system, which requires more effort on my part, perhaps, than it should. Okay, and then this begins to affect satisfaction, effectiveness, and in worst case scenario, effectiveness, meaning they can't finish what it is that they want to do. Okay, cool. So I hopefully, again, what, what I'm suggesting is, is if you just keep those four things in your mind, in mind, I'm not saying like you need to spend, you know, reading books and doing, just keep them in your mind as you're working on projects your system will wind up being much uh, uh, designed better for flow. Okay, so let me go through the process. So I'm going to give an example of Columbia University's Human Rights Web Archive, HERWA. Um, here's what the site, it's still in beta, we're still working on it. Uh, here's what the site looks like. It contains an index of 499 websites, over 50 million documents, and two and a half terabytes of data. So it's a lot of information, okay? Uh, it's a pretty, pretty simple design. Uh, um, so to me, the process of designing for flow involves three steps. Designing with the principles in mind. So while you're starting the design process, you're already thinking in terms of these principles. These principles are mainly drawn from usability. So I don't think Usability is something that you tack on at the end to see if something's good or not. I think that usability is something that you're always doing. It's the checks and balances to design in general. So the usability is something that you keep in your head as you're designing, right? As a way of checking and balancing your design. Hopefully that, that, that makes sense. Okay, so designing with the principles in mind really is starting by asking questions and answer as much as possible. Questions that include, you know, who is our primary audience? Who is it that we're really designing for? What are their characteristics? What is, what is their age range? The example I'll show you in, in a minute, people in their 20s, man, they're just like, boom, boom, done. People in their older people had a, a lot more trouble. Why? Because the mental model that they come with is very different from the mental model of a 20-some year old, right? They grew up in a 20-something, a, a you know, we could call them digital native if you want, grew up in a world that, that, that interaction with information is three-dimensional and the idea that information is hidden is normal for them, right? For many of us in this room, the idea that we would actually hide information, there's so much information that we would hide it, is like, you know, that's not how I grew up, but that's, that's how it is now. 
So what are their most common tasks? This is important. What is it that people want to do? There's going to be more important things and less important things, and you want to optimize towards the most common tasks. What are their preferred ways of completing their important tasks, etc.? So this is when I do this work, I find a lot of times people think that there's wrong answers at this point, but there isn't. Just think. Think, ask. Ask the people who are using the system. If you're a system user yourself, ask yourself these questions. There's no wrong answers, but there's some that are better than others. Okay? So this is just keeping these things in, in mind. So even as you're, if you're doing the design yourself, you're sitting there chugging along, just think, is, is this how my primary user would think about completing this task? You're, you're always doing that. You're always thinking in terms of flow. So for this project, flow included uh, uh, two main ways of, of, of flowing through the system. Um, one is just basic search, and two is a tab navigation. Um, I, I could get into, uh, 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 you know, the, 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 we have uh, directed search and known item search is really the top bar, and more like browsing and unknown item searching is, is the tabs. Of course, it's not exactly like that, but you, you, get, you get what I mean. Okay, cool. So the next is testing the design using the principles, okay? So this really means just doing a quick usability study. Uh, it fascinates me that unless you're building an application for, let's say, uh, I don't know, you're doing something for NASA or air traffic control or a nuclear power plant. Look, all that you need is this, I use this laptop and I run a Silverback. It's a $90 piece of software. So that's how I do my testing, right? So you, des you, you, you identify the tasks to complete, which are the ones that you decided at the beginning, right? Here's the most important things that people want to do. And then you, you create a post-test questionnaire, which helps to identify satisfaction. And then you only need to test with six to nine anticipated users. This is, uh, uh, Jacob Nielsen did a study back in the day uh, and shows that you, know, you can get over 80% accuracy of problems that exist with the design based on just testing it with six to nine of the anticipated users. That doesn't mean taking you know, your grandmother and sitting her down and having her you know, try to navigate a gaming site, okay? That's not what I'm talking about. But it might be take, you know, give the teenager 20 bucks to come and take a test in a coffee shop for half an hour. It's all it really takes. Incentive helps a lot. Cool, all right, chug it along. Doing good on time too. So this would be an example of of, of based on what are the most common tasks, we design an, an instrument that asks 12 questions. So, you know, I'm not going to read all of these. I could, but that would be then performance art, I think, and, and not a, a, a talk. Uh, find out whether the human rights now is being archived. I can tell you it's not. So we want people to, be, to know when they fail, when something isn't there, not just when something is there. Locate permission policies. Uh, locate the number of sites. These are all the most common things that people would do. And so we have them do that, right? Pretty simple. And then we create a post-test questionnaire that usually we use a Likert scale. In general, the information I was asked to locate was easy to find. Uh, overall, using the site was a pleasant experience. We try to get some data on uh, 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 what, they, what they thought. I can't show you the video because it, 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 it's, you know, it's, but we, you know, we record video of all these people, so you can see their faces as they react. Uh, uh, um, get an idea of how long does it take for them to get something versus not getting something. All right, cool. So hopefully I'm not going too quick. I think we're doing good on time. So finally, refine the design using the principles. It all just comes down to these four principles. That's it, right? So now we're just keep reusing these principles. They're all in your head, they're four, they're pretty simple. The more you use them, the better you'll get at, at noticing them. Uh, refine the principles. So this is just reviewing the results of the test, interpreting the results, and then fine tuning the design. So I'll give you an example. We did this round of tests, right? We're like, woo, our design's awesome. It's gonna be great, but guess what? There was problems that some people had. So what we found was effectiveness was positive, right? So that's good meaning people were always able to complete all of the tasks. Uh, 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 people can be very persistent, of course, but the idea of there was no failure, so that was good. Efficiency eh, really wasn't where it should be. Now, the average person doesn't know that to complete this task should take a minute. For them, it maybe took them five minutes, and we say, uh-oh, took a lot of people five minutes when we know this task can be done in a minute or two. 
So, and then satisfaction was positive. This is very, very common in these kind of tests. Anything I find, I've done hundreds of these things where people are like, yeah, you know, you look at their face, it's contorted, they're all angry, and then it's like, loved it, it was great. <laughs> and you're just like, we, and this is really because we've, we're culturally, we blame ourselves for problems with technology. We never blame the technology. I mean, it's really sad. It's, it's you want to give these people a hug and go, no, it's okay not to like what, what you do. But we blame, we seldom blame technology uh, uh, for uh, uh, not living up to the promises that it makes. Uh, yet we do that with people all the time. That's just something to think about. And the mental model was off. The mental model that we used to do the design was off. Okay. So efficiency. There was, and this is where I think it may help, help you all. There was problems understanding what faceted classification was. People were just like not getting what faceted classification was. Uh, and there was problems with differentiating descriptions and full text in the search. You see, this is the search that you pick. So we did some tests that really, you know, find this specific document, which would be a full text search. And of course, this is a huge fail, right? If people type in the name of a document and they, I mean, you'll get like millions of hits and then they don't know to go back because they've never seen this, right? So this can probably be fixed just by improving contrast, but, but, but we'll see. But it's an enormous problem right now. So the mental model, uh, people, so, so you can, the first, if I go back very quickly to the first question, you'll see spend four minutes using the site. What's the site's purpose and what are the features you noticed? People that said it's an archive did much better than people that said, oh, it's a place where a bunch of websites related to human resources are located, right? So if people had that image of an archive and what an archive was, they were more likely to succeed. Uh, likewise, uh, faceted classification. A lot of people just don't have a mental model as to this idea of being given a lot and them having the power to, 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 to narrow it down. And then finally, problems understanding the difference between a portal and a site, because this is really a portal to information that exists on archives of other sites, right? So that's so common. You get to what you're trying to get to, and all of a sudden you're just like, how do I get back? Uh, uh, it seems to be a problem for everything but PayPal, where you, you, know, you use PayPal, you're ripped off of the site you're on, you're in PayPal, and then you're pulled back, and people seem to be okay with that. But other than that, so. So this is not a problem necessarily with the, with the people's mental models, but even having a mental model in which to use these features of the site, right? So this would probably have to be made up through some type of pedagogy, through some type of instruction on the site that says how to use this for the first time that targets a building of the mental model, of these mental models, right? Ram it and ram it just, you know, like, here you go. This is how to think about this. All right, almost done. So um, this process is recursive. It's both a spiral, right? You're constantly going back to the principles as you iterate the design. And it's also a frame of reference. It's four principles in which to inframe your thinking about designing for flow, okay? So it's a frame. It's a way of seeing the world. It's a pair of glasses. But it's also a spiral because it promotes iterative design, meaning constantly making improvement. We may launch this site and then go back and using those same principles, test it with a few people again and constantly make improvements. So I'll end by saying this, you know, designing for flow includes a system of critique that provides balancing feedback to biases inherent in the process of design. Okay, I don't know, I'm just reading the slide, but good designers welcome critique and bad designers don't. So what tends to happen, not infrequently, is everyone's into it. Yeah, woo, let's design, step one, yeah. And then the results come back. And it's just like your design isn't as awesome as you thought it was. And that's the moment where a person chooses whether they want to be a good designer or not. But what gets activated psychologically in this moment is power, right? Because if we just boil it all down, design equals power. If I'm a designer, I have an enormous amount of power, right? So when my customers are telling me they don't like my design, there's a shift in the power, right? And a lot of people don't like that, or they're just not psychologically ready to handle it. So this is very important. People mean well, they go into the process, and then they, then they just kind of, 
it grinds to a halt because they can't, they take the, the critique personally rather than professionally. And there's a difference. Separating the two has an enormous amount of value, even if it's very difficult right now culturally to separate work from uh, 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 whatever is outside of work. So, all right, thanks. This is uh, David at David Walchek. There's my URL. Uh, again, these four principles, hopefully you find them helpful. Cool, thanks. Thank you.